Hello, welcome to Linux Plumbers Conference 2019. Uh, we don't have a plenary, so I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping things for the week, or for the three days anyway, and then I'll hand off to Kareem, who will get the talk started. So first off, a big thank you to our sponsors, and maybe if I actually got on the right place and did that, we could get our sponsors, uh, as opposed to this window. Um, big thank you to all of them, it's they're what makes this possible. Um, see here, there we are. Useful information, if you haven't hooked up to Wi-Fi, there it is. Um, a sad fact of life is, uh, in my experience in the 60 years on this planet, uh, people are not angels, so we have a code of conduct, and uh, this color of lanyard is uh, who you talk to if you have questions on that or something else. Uh, schedule overview is at that URL. Uh, it's kind of a nice thing set up and shows you kind of where things are. There's a bunch of other options. Uh, you guys realize we start at 10 a.m., good show. Uh, we have lunch at the Sete Kalinas, which I probably horribly mispronounced, restaurant on ground floor. That's from 1.30 to 3 p.m. We are on Iberian Peninsula time. So if you're used to a more punctual lunch schedule, you know, just relax. We're in Portugal. Uh, we're not in Spain, so it's not as late as it might be. <laughs> uh, sorry. Anyway, if anybody's Spanish, apologies. <laughs> what can I do? Uh, tonight, we have a uh, welcome reception starting at uh, 9. That's here. No buses. Tuesday night, on your own, um, unless you're in a couple of the microconferences running over, RDMA and Android, if I remember correctly, uh, in which case you're, you're here. Uh, Wednesday after plenary, we have buses starting at 7.30. That's a remote thing, so uh, 7.30 downstairs is where, where you'd be to start that up. And uh, with that, if I hit the right button, uh, yes, track owners, um, uh, Kareem, I'll be handing off to here momentarily for this track. And uh, if you're a presenter or a leader, please upload your slides to the MPC, LPC slide. That's helpful for the people who look at this via video. Some of these, not everything, but some of these things are video, so people can look at them later. And it's great if they can page the slides separately, especially when the camera focuses on your face and they're going, what's on that slide you're pointing to? So please do that. And uh, etherpads, written summary, and so on. Um, if you have an additional BOF thing, if a topic comes up in MC and you don't have time for it and you, you know, talk to one of us, get it scheduled. Actually, best if you actually post it and send us email, let us know, contact it, whichever. Uh, so first come, first serve. We have a few slots. And uh, if you have other questions, again, green yet lanyards. There's a list of the people. Uh, we have two of us in this room at this point that I can see. And with that, I hand it off to Kareem and let you guys get started with referee track number one. Thank you, sir. All right, thanks. Um, I don't, Daniel, do you want to start getting set up? So um, really quick kind of um, presentation here. So we're, we're going to be running from 10 to 11.30, give a minute or two for people to get set up. We got two presentations this morning, um, one by Daniel Chu from uh, Facebook and the other one by Julien Defossé and Beneath Ramanan Pillai, hopefully I'm pronouncing it properly, from DigitalOcean. Uh, the first presentation is about uh, out of memory uh, Daemon 2 um, and the second one is about um, taming hyper threads to be secure. All right. Um, Daniel will prefer having the questions after his uh, talk. Um, Julien and Beneath uh, don't mind you asking questions depending on you know how it goes. All right. Um, in case you've never seen the mics, okay, these are it. All right. So um, if you raise your hand for a question, I'll throw them at you. Just make sure you catch it. No. So so on. Um, apart from that, that's pretty much it for me, and I'll let uh, Daniel get going. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, thanks for showing up, everyone. Uh, so this talk is about Undi. Uh, yeah. So I'm Daniel. I work at Facebook. I do a lot of uh, Linux-related things. Uh, Undi is one of them. Uh, so to give a brief overview of this presentation, uh, I'm going to talk about motivations and past developments. Uh, so that's like the I gave a similar talk last year, uh, and so that'll be like kind of a recap of that. Uh, then I'll talk about the present state, so things that, that have happened since then. And then I'll talk about some future plans, like stuff that's not set in stone yet, uh, stuff that I'm planning on, that we're planning on doing. Uh, this talk runs a little short, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so to back up a little bit, the overall goal, uh, so to talk about why UMD exists. So first we've got to talk about resource control at Facebook. Uh, so the goal of resource control at Facebook is resource isolation across applications 
uh, in a work-conserving manner, so we don't leave stuff on the table if no one uh, is using it, or if people need it, applications need it. Uh, this is a really active area of development, so it's not a really well-solved problem yet, as it turns out. Uh, it's pretty hard to isolate applications from each other. So if one application uses a lot of memory or if it starts slamming the disk, it's actually pretty hard to prevent that application from interfering with another application, uh, as it turns out. The main uh, use case that we're trying to build this for is protecting the workload right now. Uh, so if you think of it this way, there's, um, you have a, some kind of server somewhere, you put a web server on it, you're trying to, so the, the whole purpose of that machine, why you're paying for it, is to serve web traffic, serving websites. Uh, you really want to protect that at all costs. Everything else is generally secondary. So examples of secondary things are like um, infrastructure management, like Chef or something. Uh, maybe logging demons, maybe you know, like health check stuff. Generally stuff that can be retried at a later point in time if there's resource contention. Uh, you generally don't want these auxiliary things fighting for precious resources if uh, the main workload really needs it at that point in time. Another use case that uh, is potentially very useful, but we haven't done too much work in that area yet, is sideloading of uh, batch workloads. So for example, video transcoding. Uh, you probably need to transcode this video at some point in time, something like maybe before tomorrow, but it's not urgent that we do it like right now. And so if there's you know, spare capacity on the host, uh, you can sort of sideload it in and then make sure it doesn't interfere with the main workload uh, so you can get some extra you know, work out of your system. So we deployed this to several internal machine pools, so on the order of uh, tens of thousands of hosts. So we've been doing this for uh, a little bit of time now, so we've had some experience uh, deploying in production. I'll talk about the UMD-related stuff in this talk, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. It works pretty well overall is the general gist of it. Uh, so Tajan at Facebook, he runs this whole resource control stuff. Uh, so he'll be giving talks at places, other conferences maybe. Uh, so if you happen to be there, it's, it'll be good to check out. Uh, so the, where UMD fits into all this is that UMD steps in when the kernel resource isolation breaks down. Uh, and that happens pretty frequently. The main use case being, uh, you know, application uses too much memory, UMD needs to step in because the kernel uh, just can't really do a great job of pre preventing this. And I'll talk more about that in later slides. Uh, so what is UMD? So UMD is an out-of-memory killing uh, daemon that exists in user space. Uh, that we believe it's faster and more accurate than the kernel room killer, and I'll talk more about that in uh, the next couple slides. Under the hood, it uses cgroup2, PSI, and other system stats, uh, the more traditional ones. Uh, for those not aware, PSI stands for Pressure Stall Information. It's developed by uh, Johannes at Facebook. Essentially, it says, it tells you how much wall clock time is lost due to resource shortages on a system. And this actually, it turns out, is like mo one of the most important stats that like applications care about. Uh, you generally don't really care how much total resources there are on a system until there's not enough, right? <coughs> so you really just want to find out if there's enough, and if there's not enough, how much lost work am I like? How much work am I losing due to this resource shortage? UMD is open source. It's under GPL, uh, GPL2, and there's a link to the GitHub if you want to check it out later. Uh, I'll put these slides online too. Uh, so why UMD? So why does UMD exist? Uh, so the kernel, um, uh, the kernel umkiller configuration, uh, I think, is not very intuitive. So there's like a lot of different control files and knobs you can turn. Um, a lot of them just have numbers in them, right? Uh, so there's like, some of them going from like negative, negative 15 to positive 16, some going from like, I don't know, some thousand to positive, negative some thousand to positive some thousand. Uh, and it's kind, it's kind of weird, it's not very er ergonomic to think about. And it gets especially tricky and you have multiple teams running things on one machine. So like, what are the numbers? The numbers don't have any inherent meaning. They only have meaning when you combine it with, uh, compared to other numbers, right? So it's a little difficult to coordinate. It's not impossible, but it's just really hard in the moment. Uh, generally, people at Facebook have sort of given up on doing that. Uh, one of the bad things about the kernel loom killer is it's pretty slow to act as well. So the reason behind that is that the kernel loom killer tries to protect the kernel health. Uh, so if it thinks the kernel is making forward progress, you know, it'll just keep going. Nothing else is, uh, or so the kernel will just keep moving along. Nothing, uh, it, it won't think anything bad is happening. But when in reality, user space could be live locked at this point because even if the kernel is like refaulting pages over and over, uh, technically that's forward progress and technically you're getting work done, but it's at such a slow rate that uh, it doesn't really matter because it just to user space, everything's frozen, nothing's really getting done. The kernel loom killer also doesn't have too much context on the logical composition of a system, right? All it cares is that oh, it, there's an application running in user, user space. Uh, it doesn't really care too much what it's doing. Uh, so for example, you could think of cases where there's two applications that should always be killed together because one is kind of useless without the other. Uh, and then there's other, other cases where like there's stuff that should never be killed together. Like one thing should always be killed uh, you know, nev or never killed at all. 
Another issue is that there's no really great way to customize kill action. Uh, because like for some applications, it's good enough just to do sig terms to kill the best traditional way. Uh, but for others, uh, you might want like a full song and dance. So for example, if you're running with systemd, you might have overloaded uh, system CTL reload to do something special, like say a hot restart, like uh, how dbus does it, right? You can pass the file descriptors from one process to another, and that way you can restart your service, but you don't drop any of the connections. And that's really useful for a lot of things where uh, you know, retry, uh, reconnection logic isn't like built in. One of the things I've worked on is um, network block device, so NBD. Uh, no file system can, most file systems can't handle reconnect on the block layer very well, so like you really don't want that to happen, so you really need a hot restart. Uh, so another problem with the kernel loom killer is it's somewhat non-deterministic, or at least it's pretty hard to get like fully deterministic. I'm sure there's a way to do it, so if someone's uh, done it before, I'm curious to hear about it. But generally, we've given up, at it, uh, given up on it at Facebook and just tried to use MD instead. Oh, another thing to mention is uh, most uh, machines at Facebook run with panic on room enabled. Um, that, that's why it's, uh, the reason for that is because like the kernel room killer is somewhat non-deterministic. So if, if the kernel room killer kills something, you're not really sure what it killed and it'd be better to just run the, or restart the box to get it back into a known good state. Um, that makes sense if you have enough machines and enough spare uh, capacity to do it and things get uh, auto-migrated. But for a lot of things, for smaller things, it probably matters less because uh, uh, you can probably configure it correctly. So this is a picture of, uh, this is a graph of UMD deployment. Uh, so this is the panic on UM rate before and after an UMD rollout. So you can sort of see a sh uh, sharp downtick uh, when UMD gets rolled out. Uh, you'll notice that there's no units on the y-axis. That's because we can't really share exact numbers. But I am allowed to say that it's, this is one region for one machine pool at Facebook. Uh, and yeah, you can see it's pretty effective. This sharp downtick, but as you'll, you'll notice that it doesn't quite drop to zero, although it gets closer to zero than before. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, one of the things we learned is that I think kernel, uh, the kernel killer is sort of an unavoidable fact of reality. Uh, there's just so many weird spots the kernel can get into where it'll just oom, um, uh, and there's not much you can do. I mean, it'll run out of memory, but pr it won't run out of memory in the way you think it does. Uh, like, for example, like with the min-free k-byte stuff, th if you don't get enough atomic memory, like, it'll oom, um, but there's technically more memory on the system. So it's like a legitimate oom, um, but it's like doesn't, a lot of people wouldn't like think of that as an oom, um, right? All right, so that pretty much covers the, there's a recap of all the stuff that I talked about last year if anyone was present. Uh, so now moving on to the stuff that uh, has changed since last year. Uh, so we've got UMD2 in production. Everything is running UMD2 at Facebook. Uh, and what UMD2 is, is essentially it's a rule engine. Uh, you can sort of think of it like IP tables or something. So there's like if this and this and this, do that. If this or that, do whatever. And you can like compose a bunch of rules uh, orthogonally to uh, do a configurational system. Uh, the next couple slides will show some examples of uh, UMD configuration, so it might make more sense what's going on. But uh, for now, we'll just talk about it, hand wave it a little bit. So what we tried in the past, uh, unsuccessfully tried, was a couple different things. So the first thing was a monolithic config. And the reasoning behind that was that you don't really want to configure things if you don't have to, right? It'd be really great if something just worked out of the box and it did the correct thing. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not really how it works. It was not very flexible, so it didn't. We had to scrap that idea. We tried, but then you know there's just too many different things you need to configure. Uh, the next thing we tried was plugin only. Uh, so essentially, you give a hook to some plugin, and it's like, okay, your host is zoomed. Now please do something. Uh, turns out that didn't work either. That was a very short-lived idea because no one really wants to write code, and no one really wants to understand a new thing uh, just through um killing. Uh, and looking back on it, that probably wouldn't have worked anyways, even if people are motivated enough to do this, because uh, there's just a lot of gotchas you have uh, when the host is under resource shortages. And so one of the nice things about having core plugins is that you can ship a lot of domain, specific, uh, domain knowledge in these plugins without people having to think about it too hard. Uh, and so what core plugins is essentially, you have a, very, uh, you have a bunch of very small self-contained plugins that do one thing and one thing only, and hopefully do exactly what you think they do. Uh, so an example would be like a swap-free plugin. Swap-free plugin literally tells you how much swap is left on a system. Uh, memory reclaim plugin tells you if a C group has reclaimed memory in the past, whatever duration, uh, simple stuff like that. Uh, and so building on the core plugin idea, it sort of enables something I like to sort of call gotcha-free plugins, uh, where it's like you don't get burned by things you don't know you don't know. Uh, of course, you can still make mistakes, right? So you can still like have a typo in a C group, but it should be really obvious it's your mistake and not like uh, the system's mistake. Uh, right, and so you can encode domain knowledge. Uh, so one example of that is a swap-free plugin. Uh, so if you have swap enabled on a system and there's stuff in the swap, right, so pages in swap, 
and then you decide to turn off swap, uh, the system has to bring all those pages back into main memory. And this takes some amount of time, depending on how fast your disk is and how much stuff is in main memory at the point in time. And so during that period of time, though, when the system is bringing stuff back into main memory, uh, splash proc swaps and proc meminfo present slightly different, different information that can be misleading uh, until you get burned by it. So for example, proc memminfo sort of tells you you're at 100% swap usage, uh, which makes sense because you technically are. Like you, you, like, so you say there's no more available space. All the stuff that's there is you're trying to drain out, so it's 100% usage. But proc swaps gives a somewhat more complete picture of the problem, which is like, uh, yes, you're at 100% usage, but the full capacity is actually whatever. That's the size of the partition or something, right? And so we got burned by this because we're only looking at meminfo. And then so if you turn off swap, it, the, this rule will immediately fire, saying you're out of swap. But that's not technically true because you turned it off already. It's just in the process of draining. Uh, and so that's just one example of a gotcha you can have. Uh, and that's one example of things you can encode into a plugin because, uh, yeah, you, you know, you fix it, you can add some comments in the code. Uh, but then when people use swap free, it just does exactly what they think it does. So this is an example of configuration. You probably can't really read it. That's fine. I have a simplified version here where I pseudo coded out the, uh, uh, the uninteresting details. I'll fl uh, flip, uh, flip back to the other slide in a bit after I explain this. Uh, so essentially what this is saying here, so this is not a full uh, configuration. The dot, dot, dots there say that there's more. So you usually have a couple of rule sets uh, that you compose together and you run on a system. So what this is saying is that, so please fire my detector. So if any of the detectors fire, please run the actions. So the first detector is fire if system slice, or use it at slice, workload.slice, and www.slice uh, slows by over 60%. The second detector is fire if system.slice slows by over 80%. And if either, if either of those two fire, uh, run the action, which is kill the largest memory hog on the system. Uh, this isn't necessarily like a super realistic config, but I mean, it's just an example of how things uh, technically work. Uh, and in this manner, you can compose uh, a lot of different rules, uh, just chain things together, and then you can arrive at some kind of configuration that hopefully deals with most of the cases that your system experiences. So if you look back here, I don't, I don't know how well you can see this, but I can just sort of briefly talk about it. You can see a, a pressure above plugin right here, which is measures the, looks at the pressure on the specific C groups. You have a threshold and duration variables. Then there's a memory reclaim plugin. It checks if a C group has undergone memory reclamation in the last whatever seconds, sort of like a sliding window. And then there's um, the other plugins as well. Uh, it's sort of like an arg C arg V thing, you know, pretty typical. You have the name of the plugin, the name of the program, uh, then you have the arguments. Another interesting thing that's happened is uh, drop-in configurations. Uh, so if you're familiar with systemd at all, it's essentially the same as systemd drop-in configurations. And what this allows you to do is you alter the base configuration without having to modify the base config file. Uh, and this is super useful for when containers uh, can move on and off hosts, right? So if you have a shared compute infrastructure, containers can migrate it on to the host and then migrate off the host. Uh, and lots, in some cases, you want that customization. So one example is if one container is managing its own container system, right? So there's nested containers. So if one of the nested containers tries to oom the box, you don't necessarily want to kill the entire top-level container. I mean, it's technically correct, but it's suboptimal, right? You just want to kill the ne most nested one. And so one thing you do with drop configurations is you can just say, so these containers can carry around specialized uh, configuration snippets. It's like, oh, don't kill the top-level thing, kill the nested thing. And if that doesn't work, revert to your base behavior. Uh, so one path that we considered doing, but we didn't do, was uh, in-container OOMD. So inside every container, you ship your own OOMD instance. Uh, the benefit to that would be that you don't need to write like all this drop-in configuration code and do all this uh, cleanup and setup and stuff and make sure like things don't get left over. But there's a number of different problems with that. So the first problem is that it's difficult to coordinate between the nested instance and the root host instance. So if a nested instance makes a kill, how do you coordinate that with the root host instance, right? You have some sort of communication. And if you don't, you have to very clearly uh, delegate responsibilities. And that turned out to be pretty difficult. Uh, you also don't want communication because then there's just more dependencies, more failure paths. Like if you use dbus, like then now dbus is a dependency. If you use a file system, well, a file system doesn't always work under resource shortages, right? Because um, if, you, uh, if you're out of memory, like IO doesn't really work correctly because the way IO and memory like are interlinked. Uh, another problem with that is that monitoring. Uh, so this, may, this might be more of a Facebookism, but uh, it's like the in-container monitoring infrastructure is different than the out-of-container infrastructure. So we didn't want to really maintain two separate uh, things that did the same thing. Uh, another bigger issue was that uh, it's really hard to coordinate uh, releases for in-container and out-of-container. So if you upgrade the version on the root host instance and you 
uh, you have to coordinate with the in container version too, right? Because otherwise you have two different versions running with potentially different issues and it becomes really hard to debug. Uh, and so even though you update the root host version, you don't necessarily want to update the in container version because that's not how things are designed, nor is it the way it should be. Uh, so yeah, that's why we didn't do it, uh, even though it was tempting because there's like way less code you need to write. But ultimately I think it was more maintainable to do with the, the root host uh, drop-in stuff. Uh, so we learned some lessons. So these are some pretty high level lessons. Um, most of, some of you probably might be familiar with this already. We also learned some like more low level things, but uh, I mean, that's not really relevant. I don't think really anyone runs Undo on a day to day basis here. Uh, so the first thing was that most people, including myself, were really hazy on the memory management details. So obviously this being plumbers, I'm sure there's plenty of people who actually understand it. Uh, but it turns out it's very complicated under the hood and a lot of different things can cause an oom. Uh, and it's not necessarily intuitive why that happens either. Like for example, the min free k bytes thing. Uh, so it's it's pretty important that someone does it correctly and that the work can be reused uh, because otherwise people will spend way too much time wrapping their heads around the details, uh, and sometimes people just want to get some work done. Another thing is that ooming is not a widely solved problem, at least for most places. So if you run any infrastructure at a significant scale, you're probably going to run into oom issues, uh, and that's because like bugs happen, you can have memory leaks and stuff. But also sometimes some workloads just use a lot of memory. Like for example, machine learning workloads. They tend to require a really huge amount of memory just to do like their training and stuff. Um, that can push machines right to the edge. Uh, yeah, so the, yeah, a lot of things can trigger Noom, and that's why understandable diagnostics are crucial, right? So you have the meminfo dump that goes to dmessage, but that's like pretty cryptic for people who don't know what's going on, but really useful for people who do know what's going on. Um, so what we found was really useful is uh, so each rule set is tagged with a description. The example didn't really show this, but um, a lot of rule sets are tagged with a, like a sentence long description of what it's trying to protect against. And so you just kind of show that message when the host dooms and then it's like people have uh, something to start looking at, right? Otherwise, like the <coughs> memory for dump is like you have no, unless you know what you're doing already, there's like, how do you approach that? Uh, so future improvements. So there's a couple of future improvements that Indy could um, possibly do. Uh, so the first is like, I don't know if uh, the person's in the room, but there's a, recently they added up uh, ePolable PSI files. So now you can uh, wire it up so like if like whatever change happens in whatever duration, you get notified uh, via ePaul uh, that something happened and you can take appropriate action. And this was developed for Android when you need like uh, really fast response times to like low memory situations, uh, which seems pretty useful. We might be able to use it. So the main use case I see for UMD for this is uh, because we've gotten a bunch of complaints about UMD using a lot of CPU cycles. And uh, when we profiled it, it turned out it was mostly coming from memory.stat accesses because the kernel is somewhat inefficient. Uh, so it used to be an O of N operation because it had to iterate over every single C group on the system, including C groups that have not, are like dead but not reclaimed yet. Uh, so this gets pretty expensive on hosts that uh, have a lot of C groups on them. Uh, that's recently be cha been changed in the upstream kernels to be an O of one access because now it's um, accounted on a per CPU basis. There's just like a per CPU struct that's passively accounted. And so when you access it, it's O of one, so it's much faster. So once that gets rolled out internally at Facebook, we'll see how well that works. And then if it works really well, then we'll might not need to do anything, but if it doesn't, we might need to look at the ePol stuff to try and short circuit some logic to try and do as little work as possible. Uh, another thing that's coming to the kernel is uh, IO cost. I'm not sure what the progress is, but it uh, looks like it's making progress. Um, the interesting thing about that is that, so UMD used to monitor a lot of IO metrics on the system. So you have to watch out for like when IO is oversubscribed and uh, re remediate against it. Otherwise, like memory gets kind of screwed up too because of how uh, interconnected those two things are. Uh, so what's nice about IO cost, it looks like it'll finally solve the problem. Uh, so IO latency worked, but it didn't work like too, too well. But IO cost seems to solve it much better. Uh, and what that'll let us do is avoid uh, worrying about uh, memory issues, or IO issues, so we can just focus on the memory semantics. Uh, one interesting thing we're considering, so totally not set in stone, we still need to discuss with uh, upstream systemd folks, is uh, systemd umd. Uh, so I think it'd be really interesting if we in integrated umd into systemd. Because uh, systemd is in this really nice spot in Linux infrastructure where it's sitting between the kernel and the application, so the system layer. Um, and it turns out this is a really interesting spot for UMD to live because that's kind of where it lives already. Because uh, applications really shouldn't be worrying about uh, you know, system level resource configuration. That's not really what they're there to do. And the kernel doesn't have too much insight into uh, how uh, the system should be set up in terms of resources because, it, like I mentioned before, it's like it's not really the kernel's job, I would say, to manage all this policy. Uh, so one interesting thing, so I know there's been um, discussions in the mailing list about uh, good out-of-the-box configurations for Umkiller. 
And so I think this might, so system DMD might be in a good position to deal with this because system D has enough uh, knowledge about how all the services are set up on a system, right? Uh, so it can introspect and maybe you can add some more flags like uh, let's say this slice or the system D service is interactive so we need like good responsiveness and maybe some other stuff, you know, in that vein. And then so system D can introspect when it starts up and then possibly come up with a good configuration for MD and maybe it'll be, be a good enough out of the box to deal with this kind of room issue. But I don't know, th we'll have to see and obviously, so this, to again to reiterate, um, not f uh, firm plans, we still have to like talk to system D people and then maybe if it works out, we'll play with it and we'll see what to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we'll have to rewrite UMD too if this happens, but um, yeah, I don't know, it's like a four three, right? Just another one, right? Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So, uh, oh yeah, and one other thing, if anyone wants to like talk about this system D stuff, if they have any ideas, would be I would love to hear it because better get this right in the beginning. Uh, but yeah, so that's the end of the content. Time for questions if anyone has any. Hi, uh, I'm looking at this project since uh, last Converse conference. Um, and I was wondering whether it is possible to use it with uh, C group version one, because what I have uh, seen in kernel is uh, that uh, really pressure style information is not available for C group V1. And I wasn't able to make it work with uh, C group version one, just registering uh, the hooks uh, inside uh, C groups. What do you suggest? to do? Uh, so I don't think C group one is gonna work. I don't think that they're taking any feature patches for C group one anymore, right? Uh, and Johannes is in the back of the room, he might know. I don't know, I'll just cop out. Uh, but yeah, so I guess my answer is, probably crappy answer is um, you have to migrate to C group two. And I think other projects are doing it too, like Docker's considering it and working on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, you talked about um, integrating, if I understood correctly, integrating UMD into system D. Uh, in Android, we basically have them separately, but they talk to each other. So basically AMS, which is Android um, System Manager basically, talks to LMKD mm -hmm. and tells it what's important, what's not unimportant. So it might be interesting venue to uh, look at instead of kind of integrating everything into one one piece of um, one software basically having to separately but talk talk to each other to explain what's important what's not yeah that's interesting yeah yeah I'd like to talk about I'd like to talk about that later uh, like okay. yeah offline but uh yeah I mean that's obviously we c something we consider but um I don't know if it, they're talking to if they're already talking to each other wouldn't I mean I sort of think of that as like integration already right yeah, you have to like make system D changes to probably understand that stuff and UMD changes too, yeah. Um, so in GNOME, we are actually moving to a system D managed session now and there's also been discussions to force the out of memory killer in some situations uh, just to make sure that uh, we are not running into low memory situations. And it seems like OMD would be a much better solution for us in, in principle but we do have the issue that like this GNOME session is running on the system D user instance, which is a bit similar to the container case. And I wonder if how well the separation works with OMD or do we just run two instances, one on the system, one on the session, user session, or what do you see the path forward in that case? Um, we can always have OMD like running just one instance and then just only monitor like stuff under the user session. Uh, that theoretically could work. If I'm so understanding the que question correctly. So we would run one uh, UMD inside the user session only, uh, rather well than inside the... Well, so you just run on the root host, right? So you run it in like, um, I don't know, some other slice, like we, we usually call it host critical that slice, stuff that really needs to be up on the system. And then it would only monitor stuff under user that slice, because UMD doesn't have to monitor the entire system if you don't want it to. You can configure just to like look at some portion of the hierarchy. I think the issue is that on the, sorry, <laughs> on the um, on the host system, you don't really see what's going on inside the user. So, um, like killing of one application, user application, might be hard from the host. Uh. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think we should talk about this later. Like, get some whiteboard or something. 
but uh, I feel like it should be possible. Maybe we just need to discuss right. it. So I have two questions. One is, um, how does Umdi decide that having killed some uh, container is enough? When do you decide to, okay, to check again the pressure levels or some other metrics to decide to kill again? Um, and the other question is, um, okay, uh, let's stay at the yeah. first one. Uh, okay, so to answer the question, it's not a very elegant solution, but it seems to work pretty well. It, there's a post-action delay. It's like, by default, it's like, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds. It just sleeps for 30 seconds and then checks the regular stuff again. Uh, and my second question is, um, do you have a concept of a good and be bad reclaim? Essentially, in some cases, you may want to allow reclaim if it's not reclaiming, um, if it's not causing thrashing, and in other cases, the same amount of reclaim can be bad because it's causing thrashing. Does UMDI no, can only notice that somehow? Uh, not right now, but that sounds like a pretty good idea, if it's possible. Uh, I saw in your abstract that you mentioned there is a, a predict way to, uh, to, to, uh, to detect the OEM killer scenarios. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you, uh, how do you predict those scenarios, and why, uh, why, why do we just change the, uh, the threshold to trigger the OM killer? Uh, so which thresholds are you talking about for the kernel in killer? Yeah. I mean, uh, you mentioned a predict, pre you, you can predict the yeah. OM scenarios. Mm -hmm. So how do, how, oh, okay. how do you do that? Um, so usually if the pressure values are high enough, say like 50%, it means the application is spending 50% of its time uh, just waiting for resources. Um, so that's usually a pretty good indicator that the host is like pretty much out of resources. Like you can, obviously we, you need to pl uh, play around with the thresholds like we've done. Uh, but yeah, at a high enough value, the application is pretty much doing nothing and it's pretty good, um, you know, it's pretty, it, it's, you could pretty much tell it's trending towards rooming. Okay. Um, so I, if I understand this correctly, the OMD is, is killing based on monitoring. So it's seeing that certain values are uh, yeah. rising and then it makes decisions. Uh, is there any desire for something similar to like core dumps where you can actually have a hook in the kernel? So the kernel can actually trigger a user space application, uh, in this case OMD, when it jumps in because there are certain situations with page fault and, and things like this. There's no way a user space application could react in time. And uh, so this is the nice thing about core dumps through the, the core dumping feature in the kernel is that you can actually configure it to trigger a user space application to handle the core dumps. And it seems like that interface is missing for the OM killer, that it could mm -hmm. trigger a user space application to handle that <coughs> decision. Um, so I think that actually exists. There's a um, um event, uh, event FD, I think, for C group, I think. In C groups, yeah. Yeah. But on a system, on, 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 on the host level, there's not anything. Uh, so yeah, as I mean, far as I know. Yeah, so I think that's a good idea, but then I think you run into the issue of policy, right? So like what, now you have to describe to the kernel exactly what you're looking for. And maybe if you have a bunch of different hooks, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Like, but in general, I feel like PSI is that hook. Uh, you just hook into PSI, if it gets high enough, you do something. Um, but yeah, in general, it's like if you could get it like fine grained and then orthogonal enough, which it might make sense. Like okay, because yeah, my concern is there's something maybe you're missing, yeah? And so then if the OM killer does jump in, you know, that you have sort of a last resort, then it should call the OMD again and say, mm -hmm. hey, it should just start killing things, right? Because at that point, you've totally lost control of your system if the OM killer does jump in. Right. Uh, yeah, I suppose, yeah, I suppose you could hook into like the more obscure cases as well and just try and trigger the OM killer. Yeah, yeah, that might be a good idea. Just somebody, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.